Okay, welcome everybody. Good afternoon. This is John Walken. I'm the director of the Acting Conservatory here at Orange County School of the Arts, as you probably know. And it's a great pleasure to have you all with us. Um, today's event, very special event, is part of our fifth annual Master Artist Series. And this series brings acclaimed artists and industry professionals to OSHA to work with our talented students, building their skills and providing inspiration and guidance for their futures. Um, this year, we have an impressive list of visiting guest artists, including Academy Award winning costumer Ruthie Carter, trailblazing ballerina Misty Copeland, and Academy Award winning screenwriter Kevin Wilmot. Um, we're deeply grateful to our sponsors, um, Anonymous, Kenton Brandy, Barcures, uh, the Bouchalala family, Farmers and Merchants Bank, I'm making sure I don't miss anybody here, the JE Foundation, Deb and Aaron Malo, the Macbeth Foundation, Maureen and Michelle Mechgen, O.L. Halsell Foundation, the Sumbasakas family, Good Acting Conservatory family, Yamaha and Charlie and Ling Zhang, for supporting OSHA and helping to provide our students with unparalleled opportunities like these. Um, we'd like to really express our gratitude to Jeanette um, Sumbasakas, who's here in the audience with us today. And especially, we'd like to point out one of our acting conservatory dads, Mr. Stan Sandy Sternshein, who made this introduction possible with our special guest artist today. So thank you for that, Sandy. We're glad to have you with us and we really appreciate everything you do for us. So now it is my great pleasure to get to our special guest today um, and introduce this world-renowned actor and writer and comedian, David Pasquese, who um, will be hosting this interactive discussion with us. Uh, you can feed questions into the chat. We'll have a Q&A near the end, uh, but first we'll let David talk a little bit. His website describes him as, let me get this, an improviser, a voiceover guy, and an actor based in Chicago. And those are really interesting things that we've not really talked a lot about with guest artists. So please join me, first of all, in welcoming our special guest, Mr. David Pasquese. Thank you for coming, David. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Osha. We're so happy to have you here, David. And there, there, there's so many things to talk to you about. I, I really don't know where to start. I mean, you're one of those guys, I assume, that everywhere you go, people look at you and say, hey, that guy, that guy, um, I could go through a whole list of a million things that you've done in movies and television and commercials and voiceovers and improv. Where do you want to start? Um, I, uh, uh, I rarely get. Uh-oh. Hey, that guy, um, I usually can't. Do you have me? Yep, we see you. You just okay. froze up for a second, but you're back now. Sorry about that. Yeah, um, I'm currently in California uh, on a job, and I'm in I'm uh, beholden to the hotel's Wi-Fi. So I apologize. You know, we're all kind of subject to that these days. It's a Zoom world, and it's glitchy. So glitch away. We'll wait for you. Um, let's start with this idea. Uh, I think this is really interesting, David, that, you know, we tend to talk about LA and New York as places for actors to go. And you're dealing with a whole room of young artists who are maybe interested in going into this profession. But you're one of those guys who has pretty much stayed in Chicago your whole career, right? Mostly. I mean, I've always been based out of Chicago. Yes, I've spent a lot of time in Los Angeles and I've spent a lot of time in New York and I've had places you know, apartment in Los Angeles for a long time. But um, I always was based out of Chicago. I have a family and they grew up, my sons grew up in Chicago. And um, Chicago is an interesting place because um, it, uh, you're not going to be plucked off of a stage for a huge job. It's not going to happen in Chicago, but it's quite possible that it would happen in New York or Los Angeles. So it's for people who are just using a particular production as a stepping stone, it's really a stupid place for them to be. So you get people who are merely there to do the job. I, th I think that we honestly do have that advantage. 
Wow. Yeah. And there are, there are a handful of great theaters there and you've worked at all of them, I know. Um, so let's start, let's start quickly with the idea of how you got started. So you, you're like me, you're a Midwestern guy, Illinois, right? Right. And, and I think also like me, you didn't act in high school. It came to you late. How did that happen? Well, I, right. I did not act in grade school or high school. So you all have a, a huge jump. Um, and not even in college. Um, it was, I was almost out of college by the time I stumbled into an uh, improvisation workshop with my older brother, who was in law school at the time. And he was going just, which was a common thing back then. People in advertising or people in business would often take improvisation classes to loosen up. Um, but it wasn't really a career path. Um, and so I just, tagged along with him and I really fell for it from the very beginning. I really enjoyed it, but I was planning in school to go into grad school into either business school or law school. So it was just a little something to do for a few months while I was going to college. Wow. And then I, I think I heard somewhere along the line that you actually turned down drama school, the great school at Northwestern to wait at no. a pizza restaurant and, and go into your career. I know I turned down business school at Northwestern. Yeah, it was Kellogg oh, Business. With your folks, uh, they they of course were thrilled, um, uh, and well, also because they it's understandable that they were afraid for me that I would starve because they no one in our family has ever been in the arts at all. They've all been business people or or um, retail folks and men concrete or law or um we have an ad we have everybody but an actor in our extended family um and so they just as my father said you can be the worst lawyer in the country and make a great living you can be the best actor in the country and start and i and so that was what his concern was born out of not out of they didn't think i was any good or any that didn't enter into it i don't know if they thought i was any good <laughs> Wow. You, you know, the, the fact that you that it was improv that opened the door for you is is really it's really interesting to us. We have a we have a terrific long form improv teacher here. But um, tell us a little bit because you really worked for the godfather of improv. Right. I, I know most of our students wouldn't recognize the name Del Close. But tell us a little bit about Del Close and Second City and how, what that was. Would they recognize the name Harold for a long form improvisation? No? Okay. Harold? Yeah, the Harold. It's a, it's, a, it's a long form improvisation that, that Dell was working on. It's the first thing that we were doing with him to uh, provide an evening's entertainment, which was only long form group improvisation. And before that, that was always used as a, a method to create material which would be scripted and then repeated. But his belief was that improvisation can be good enough that that's the evening, um, that that in itself is the entertainment. And that was not a popular uh, belief. Um, and, and I think he's been borne out to be correct, that it can be Excellent. And so that's the guy I fell in with. I just happened to be with him when he was developing this thing. And, and that was a series of serendipity that allowed me to be there in the first place. So I, I went over to school in Rome and my roommate was Joel Murray, who's uh, Brian Doyle Murray and Bill Murray's little brother. And when we got back to Chicago, he ended up, we ended up finding Dell and falling in with him. And, uh, and I had that little bit of experience before that. And I, again, just really enjoy improvisation because you don't, you just walk out and you don't know what's going to happen. And it, to me, that's thrilling because it's scary and, uh, and it's really an adventure each time. And I love that about it. Yeah. It's um, how, you know, we all assume that when you get acting jobs and you've been in all kinds of movies, Groundhog Day, Father of the Bride, Angels and Demons, all these great movies and TV shows. And I think most of our students know you from Veep probably. Um, and we always think of these jobs as scripted. So how did improv help you, do you think, as an actor? And how's that evolved? For you? Well, I remember one of the uh, first jobs I got in a play, the director said after the audition, you're being hired because uh, 
you listened better than anyone else. Mm. And I think that's what improvisation does. It, may, it, it helps one with the skill of listening, because if I don't listen, I will likely be humiliated um, because the audience will, they already know everything that's going on, but if I'm not paying attention, I'm, I'm a step behind and that's a bad place to be in. And I do, I say humiliation. I really do believe that the, the fear of public humiliation is an excellent motivator. It is for me. Because uh, it will happen. It does happen. And it will happen again for me. Um, yeah, I'm with you. Um, you know, when, with, with our students, a lot of the time, the first hit of improvisation they get is at commercial auditions where they'll walk in and somebody will say, okay, do, do this, do this. Was that your experience too? Because you booked commercials fairly early in your career, right? I did, I, I did. Um, and the ones that I booked were people who liked the people from Second City to come and goof around. Um, so there, was, there were directors in Chicago um, that, that would hire us over, other, over straight actors that, uh, because there was a different skill set. Um, um, and sometimes you walk, they're not really looking for improvisation. Sometimes they're just looking you to, for you to write their spot for them, um, uh, which is what it is. Uh, but um, yeah, I, uh, so there's that difference between actually improvising or just coming up like there's all improvisation is such a huge umbrella that even within the theater. There's, there's a short form, the games, there's the long form uh, group improvisations. There are these uh, two man shows that I, uh, I did a two man show for about 20 years. And um, there it's, they all have different job descriptions too. Some of them are supposed to be really funny. Some of them aren't, they're just supposed to be honest and hopefully interesting. Yeah, uh, the, the two man show you did, it was that the TJ and Dave? It is, right. Which, and you guys wrote a, a, a book that's really popular? We did, we wrote a, a book about how, kind of how we look at improvisation. And um, I find that it, it's, a, it's a little different than the way other people might look at it. Yeah, it, it's called Improv at the Speed of Light, right? As, at the Speed of Life. Life, and it's probably on Amazon, I might guess. Yeah, you can get it on Amazon, you right. can find it, yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a shameless plug for you, Please. how about that? Good. Thank you. Um, yeah, and let me let me pass this on to our students. This is, a, this is a great quote. Stephen Colbert said about you two guys, one of these guys is the best improviser in the world and the other one is better. It doesn't get much better than that, does it? He's an idiot though. <laughs> I love that. I really did. Um, so Second City, I, I don't even know how aware everybody is of Second City. It, it was already kind of, it was a, it's a group in Chicago that specializes in improv, right? It, and it kind of, there was a generation a little older than you, right? Who, Belushi and those guys who fed into Saturday Night. Exactly. Yep. It, it, the first gang was Alan Arkin. Um, and then Dell came in not long after that, and um, uh, Paul Sills and um, Severn Darden and, and Mina Cole. Uh, it was a Howard Auk, um, uh, Paul Sands. It was this great gang, and they were. And again, it's under the. Um, they say it's improvisation, but it's really a sketch group. And Barbara Harris too. Um, and Nichols and May came through, and and so it, it was these fan that was the origins and then it was around for a while and then every now and again these amazing groups show up and one of the casts was uh john belushi joe flaherty harold ramus brian doyle murray judy morgan who was my first improv teacher mm. um and it was and then again other other gangs come along and they're just these so that was the group in Chicago. That was the theater in Chicago that was the only job for people with my kind of experience, which was improvisation and some comedy. And so that was the, the only real paying job. Um, and at that time, the theaters didn't really look to us to be able to do real theater. They kind of looked at, looked at us as the, you know, the buffoons of Second City and 
and that they're doing real acting. And that right. has changed. That has changed. I mean, they hired me to do stuff. So that was really great because yeah, of you're, you're right across town from Steppenwolf and you've got right. Malkovich and all those guys over there doing the serious stuff. And you guys are the clowns, right? Exactly. And they and in fact, they did a send up of uh, Steppenwolf at, uh, with uh, uh, Dan Castellaneta and Richard Kind and Mike Haggerty, their gang. Wow. So I'm guessing that, especially in the early years, you probably didn't make a lot of money doing this kind of thing. So oh, how did you get by? How do you, you know, as your dad is saying to you, you should have been a lawyer, you should have gone into business. What you, how do you get by? Well, you, as, and you mentioned a bunch of things uh, that I do, and, and that's what I had to do. I had to write and do commercials and work at a restaurant and do improvisation and do stand up and do plays and do whatever I could to cobble together a career. And, um, and I like each one of those things, fortunately. Um, uh, yeah, and I, I've been able to have experience, more experience at doing each of those things merely out of necessity. Mm -hmm. uh, and they all kind of end up in a way related, don't they? I mean, uh, like, I'm sure when you were there and you were young, there were guys or girls that you thought, oh, she's going to do well. He's going to do well. And then there were others who just came out of nowhere. And then down the, down the road, you go into an, an, an audition or something and there's Harold Ramis. And, and this is a guy you knew before who's now casting you in a movie. Did that happen for you along the way? Um, actually, I'm working now for a guy that I knew from Second City, uh, who I haven't spoken to in a long time, but all of a sudden he said, hey, come out and do this show. And uh, it's, that's a hoot. That happens a lot. I mean, it was kind of rare. I, uh, I went down and did this show in uh, Atlanta a few years ago, and uh, it was, I think, the first time that I didn't know anyone. Because I've always walked onto a, a show and I've known someone or known someone who they know because mm -hmm. it's of Chicago or Second City. And this was the, I think, and this, you know, I've been doing it for a long time. That was the first show I've ever walked on that I didn't know somebody. It was kind of neat. And because of the tentacles of Chicago and Second City. Wow. Yeah, that's amazing. You mentioned early on that people in New York and LA, they sometimes, sometimes their rocket to stardom is a play or something like that. But for you, it was really kind of the network you built, right? Absolutely. And, and the lovely thing is, because that's not going to happen, people really are there just to try to do this thing that we're doing. Um, and it's a, that's a lovely thing to be a part of. And it, there's a more a sense of community, I believe, in Chicago. At least there, I don't know what it's like to be starting there now, because I'm not. But um, I still am in contact with that great community that I know from 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and I still see it, I think, um, within the people that are coming up through Chicago now. Yeah. It's less competitive, more communal. Mm -hmm. So as you started, as you started to cobble this career in Chicago and you're getting to getting some momentum and you're becoming a big Chicago guy or a known Chicago guy, why what, what was involved in your deciding, I'm just going to stay here. I like Chicago. I like living here. I'm going to raise my family here. Why didn't you go off to New York or LA like everybody else? I was able to make money in Chicago and a lot of people weren't um, because I was doing commercials and voiceover. And so I was, I was making a living there and a lot of people had to move because that's where the jobs were. Um, and for better or worse, I, I, stay, I was able to stay in Chicago. Mm -hmm. So but then, you know, they're building reputations and careers in Los Angeles then. And I didn't. I, I had to I, when I, I come out, I kind of had to start all over again, because unlike uh, colleges, uh, credit doesn't transfer between Chicago and uh, Los Angeles. Yeah, I understand. Um, was there a point where you felt like, okay, I'm big enough in Chicago now, I'm becoming a big fish, I need to do that for my career, or was that never a factor for you? It, 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 it wasn't. I, was, I always liked work, and I was able to go 
back and forth a lot. I was able to travel, although uh, Chicago was a home base. And I'd come out to Los Angeles for chunks of time. And I had jobs out here that kept me out here. Um, I don't know that I ever, no, I, I don't think so. I, I'm happy to go where the work is. And that's one of the reasons I stayed. The work was in Chicago. It's less for me there now, but it's also less of a big deal for me to go places. Yeah. Um, you've worked at all the all the major theaters in Chicago. I mean, I, I don't know what's happened since the pandemic, but uh, are all the theaters still thriving there? Um, well, um, the one that I came up through with improvisation, IO, which was Dell's Theater, they shuttered and they're not coming back. Wow. Um, Second City is for sale. Um, I don't know about Steppenwolf and the Goodman. I believe they'll probably weather it mm -hmm. um, as uh, I believe those th they'll probably be weathering it. Do you know if uh, what's happening with Northlight or Remains or Victory Gardens? Any oh, of those? Remains, Remains gone a while ago. That was one of the, that was the first play I did was at Remains. Uh, What'd you do uh, there? The, the Chicago Conspiracy Trial, for the Frank, Frank Condon. Condon. Yeah, exactly. we from the Odyssey out here. Yeah, he directed it. Yep. He was okay. great. Um, uh, and uh, Victory Gardens is there in the old Biograph Theater, and I think they'll probably also come back. Mm -hmm. When um, we, we have several alumni from our program who have gone to either the Goodman or a couple of other schools in Chicago, what, what, what would you say to a young actor who's thinking about, okay, once I get out of here, I'm either going to go to New York or LA or why would, why would they go to Chicago, do you think? Well, as I, uh, I, that's a, that's a great question. I often, when I talk to uh, younger actors, they, they ask, and I, I think it's important for someone to, without judgment, think about what it is I want to do right now. What do I want to do right now? And sometimes it's, I want to get better on stage. And if that's your goal, I believe there's no better place than Chicago because there's a lot of theaters um, and you can do, you can work at all of them. Mm -hmm. and, um, and people come to see it. And whereas, uh, so if that's the goal, I think Chicago is an excellent place. And you, you don't have to have 100 jobs to afford rent like you do in, in New York. Um, it's still a, a manageable city. Right. If what you want to do is be on a TV show, and again, without judgment, if that's what I want, that's what I want. Um, Chicago is a, a, a stupid place to do that. There's just, um, there are better places for that. Um, but if I'm confusing, if I lie to myself thinking, uh, I just want to be better on stage, but what I really want is to be on a TV show, then I, and here I find myself in Chicago, it's just going to be uh, a disaster. I'm going to be filled with resentment because this thing that I'm doing cannot possibly give me what it is that I want. So mm -hmm. I have to constantly reevaluate what it is that I want. Great. Yeah, because if if you are headed for film and TV, really LA is the place, kind of, isn't it? Because there are more jobs. Absolutely. There are more actors, but there are just way more jobs, right? I, absolutely. And even the jobs that don't film there are cast there. Right. Um, like it, I've gotten jobs in Chicago because I happened to be standing in Los Angeles. They just don't hire locals in Chicago for more than day player stuff. Yeah. Isn't the old saying you have to go away to get famous? Is yeah, it's yeah. And it's it's silly, but it's real anyway. doesn't yeah. matter if it's silly. It's real. Yeah, I, I think everybody kind of feels it. We used to say in LA that you had to go somewhere else before you could appear at the taper. You had to go to New York before you could be in a play at the taper, you know? So I think there, there's a lot of that everywhere. Um, let's talk a little bit about self-generating work. That's something that you're really, I mean, in a way, you, you have this amazing career where you've gone from improv and and theater to episodic tv and sitcoms and voiceovers and commercials and movies you've really kind of gone everywhere um and you generate a lot of your own work don't you yes and that's one of the things that i got from second city there you are coming up with your own material 
you have a director, but they're not really there to, uh, they're there to shape the show rather than maybe, so you're allowed to do your own material how you want to do it. And uh, that is wonderful. And also it's really, um, it ruins you for every, everything else because you never get to do that again, unless I'm doing my own stuff. And one of the reasons that I find myself, <laughs> one of the reasons I do a lot of my own stuff is uh, I don't get hired. <laughs> so, so if I want to work, I have to make my own stuff. Um, well, you say that with a with that great smile of yours, and then someone looks at your resume and goes, "Well, I give anything for that career." But I think what you're touching on that's interesting, David, is you as a professional, working, successful actor. You have a lot of downtime, don't you? Yeah, and 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 that's not good for me. Um, I know some people can sit around and wait for a phone to ring, and that's just not something for me that's helpful. And I always remember um, what it, you know, what it is that I started, what, what it is I enjoyed in the first place, because it's easy to forget. Um, what I really enjoy is working with my friends. Mm -hmm. um, and it's easy to forget that, to think that, oh, these other things, like um, that other things are more important. I, I get confused. Yeah, I, I hear you. I mean, you find yourself on a set with, like in your case, Tom Hanks or George Clooney or all these big, big stars that, I don't know about you, but even the day you show up, yeah, your heart is kind of pounding. Oh, I'm going to, I'm going to meet Tom Hanks today. And that's exciting. How do you, how do you remain calm and sort of do your own thing and be confident when that happens? Does that, does that affect you? Of course, uh, but it happens every job, whether, whether or not who they are. Um, the night before a new job, I'm, I don't sleep. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter what, how big the job is. I don't, I don't, I, because I'm invested in it. I don't want to, I don't want to screw it up. Um, but also I find that the people, I, they make you feel real comfortable. Like you mentioned Harold Ramis before. That was one of my first jobs I, with, with big shots. Mm -hmm. And he just, he was, he's just the sweetest man. So he, he made me feel comfortable enough to, and I think that's part of the job of the director too, is to make the actor feel comfortable enough to be good, as good as they can be. Um, yeah. Because if they're nervous, you're not gonna get anything good out of that, I don't think. And it's, it's also interesting, I just saw, so I watch a lot of uh, little uh, actors interviews and I watched one today about, um, with Jack Nicholson as he was younger and they were asking him about jobs. And he said he was able to um, work for a casting director and he read opposite people. Mm -hmm. And he said that was, he saw all the actors come in and read for the part. And he said, you know, they weren't that great. And he's found that encouraging. He's like, oh, this isn't that huge of a hurdle, right? There's not that much difference between these people who are known names and me who is just getting started. Um, it's just, I can, I can do my best it's right along with them. People don't know it. People don't know that I'm good, but I'm, I'm good enough to be doing this. Yeah, and also I remember there's a little story with Tom Hanks. I screwed up a take and I was all mad at myself. And I, he goes, well, what's the matter? I go, I, I, screwed, I screwed it up. He goes, uh, they're going to do another one. I can totally picture that. You know, it's just so, so calming and helpful. You know, I'm sure you would back me up. I worked with Tom Hanks before, too. And he's like the he's exactly like you'd think he would be, isn't he? he yeah, exactly like you'd hope. He's just wonderful. Just the nicest guy. And again, makes it really easy for you to be comfortable enough to do your job. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. You know, when I think of my friends who got famous or broke through or for whatever reasons, and it's striking me in talking with you now too, um, one of the things that seems to be similar to every one of them is they really are who you think they are. They're very authentic people. You seem like a very authentic guy. You're exactly what I thought you would be. Do you find that true also? 
I, 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 there's another one that I, uh, Peter Jason, I don't know if you know him. Peter Jason's fantastic guy. Sure. Been and in a million movies. Absolutely. Been here, been here doing it forever. He's a fantastic guy. And I remember him talking about an audition too. And he said, one of the reasons for the audition is you come in and you do a, the, a good job. And he said, yeah, but there's 10 guys out in the waiting room who are going to come in and do a good job. What you're also doing is showing these people that you are someone they want to hang around with for two weeks. You know, it's not merely doing the material, it's allowing a little bit of your true self, your personality to come through, even in the off time, you know? Yeah, that's really, really true. Wow. Um, how, let's, uh, boy, I don't know, uh, there's so much other stuff I'd love to talk to you about. Um, how, did, uh, how did Veep happen? Uh, I have uh, a great agent, um and that i've had since i started um wow, that's yeah. rare yeah paula music she's fantastic she wasn't my agent for a little while she was my manager for a little while and then she went back to being an agent so she was my agent again um but and i also the casting director was uh allison jones who uh is fantastic and they kept bringing me in um for the whole first year they brought me in uh i went in for the pilot and they kept bringing me back for different parts. And I finally got the one that I got and that lasted for the rest of the series. That's, that's a great lesson because as an actor, you just, when you don't get a role, you just feel like, Oh, I didn't get it. But it's easy to forget that still your stock could be rising with the casting director and the director. They just thought we'll find something else from as, as that happened to you a lot. Uh, I suppose so. And also, I, I mean, I tend to work with the same people more than once. Mm -hmm. um, and it, yeah, and also casting directors. I, I'm real grateful to the casting directors who keep bringing me back, even if I don't get jobs, even if I don't book the job. And that's, you know, Allison Joan, Deb Zane, the, uh, Bonnie Zane, Pillsbury, yeah. just all these great casting directors. They're wonderful. And they, they well, bring you back because you always make them look good in front of the director and the production company. One yeah, right. and right. I think that is like, I uh, I used to work a lot in voiceover and people ask me why I work. <laughs> I show up on time and I'm not an asshole. That's, and I think that puts me head and shoulders above other people. And in the, in, in the, in the other acting business, I show up prepared, you know, I show up prepared for auditions. Yeah. Yeah, I'm with you. Um, you guys, we're, we're winding into maybe the last 10 minutes or so. So if you want to put questions in the chat room, um, that's a good way to go. Molly Ray, thanks for doing that. And uh, I'll field these as best I can. David, let's talk a little bit about um, something like Graveyard. That's something that you and your friends made, right, on the internet? It is. Um, and again, that's people that I've worked with before. Chris Stolte and I had been in a play together. And in a, uh, the third guy is the guy who directs it, Ron Lazaretti. And the three of us write them all together. And we, again, we were just, we want to do something together. And so we did this. And it's manageable. Um, I remember that Coppola saying so many, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, he said, you know, the next great filmmaker is going to be some girl in, in Iowa because the means of production are not limited to this huge money studio anymore. The means of production, we can shoot them on our phones. We can, we can get stuff done and there's no, we don't have processing fees anymore and stuff like that. So we, if you have an idea, you can, you can actually manifest it. So we put together a little gang. We wrote all these things that we think are funny. Um, and that's a lot of it. This would entertain me if I was the audience. That's basically it. That's great. Um, and Quinn Barraza, if you can, uh, if you would mind putting that Zoom link or that link to uh, um, Graveyard where people could check that out. It's really fun to watch because it does look like a bunch of friends having a good time. And I, I, I remember when I first worked with those guys um, from It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia and, and that whole story about how they made their own thing and they didn't get paid the first, like the whole first season. And then it just took off. And it's really, doable isn't it yeah i don't know i don't have the experience of something really taking off but um it's doable <laughs> to make it in the first place it's all relative isn't it though well right and and also that other stuff done it, it, there's i don't have we i i don't know i don't think we have a lot of control over that no. i just so we just keep making them did you ever have that moment in your life david where you made something like 
I don't know, maybe Groundhog Day or something that everybody saw and you walked around for a little while on a cloud thinking, okay, here we go. Everything's going to change now. And what happens? Yeah, uh, nothing changed. Uh, but you just keep going back to, you go back to the next audition. <laughs> yeah. But also, I do think one of the things that you mentioned about walking onto a set and being less nervous, that comes from experience. It's the same thing as walking into an audition. You know, I walk into an audition and I was really nervous. My first time I'm walking into a casting director's office in Los Angeles and I'm really nervous. And so I can't really do a good job, but only through repetition do I become less nervous. And then I go to the, you know, the producer session and I'm really nervous for the producer session and, and I don't get it. But then after a while, I start going to the producer session and that doesn't mean as, you know, I'm not as nervous. So I do believe that that going on every audition that I can helps me for the ones that I really want. I may not want this job, but the uh, going for it anyway is gonna be helpful. Just the experience. Yeah, that's a great point because you learn how to take care of your business in a way, right? You learn how to, okay, I know now I need to take a deep breath and get present or whatever it is you need to do before you, because it never gets any easier. I remember Adam Sandler saying once in something I was involved in saying, you think it gets easier when you're getting paid $20 million to carry a movie? No, it just gets worse, you know? So you kind of have to learn how to take care of your business. One of the students, I'd, oh, go I'd ahead. Love, yeah, I'd love to know what that feels like. Yeah, I hope you do. I think, frankly, this conversation is going to launch a whole new chapter for you. <laughs> Finally! How did you get involved with the, 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 the magnificent Mr. Sternshine and that project? What's that all about? Well, I know uh, uh, Sandy through the film uh, Later Days that he wrote and directed um, and through his friend Brad Riddell in Chicago. So that's how I, so I worked for him. That's how I know him. I worked for him. He's the boss man. He's a good guy. We we're lucky to have him around here. I'm glad that was not my experience. No, was he really tough? Uh, just between you and me and the other 190 yeah, people. I here. mean, just between us. Yeah. All right. I, I suspected as much. Okay. Let me see. Here's some other questions. Oh, this is a good question. Um, is taking part in a bad project worth it to you? Uh, it, some, well, excellent question. Um, I, I was. Uh, so I think there are boxes that need to be ticked for any decision, right? Why am I taking this job? Um, and at the beginning, I'm taking every job because I want the experience. Right. Every, every job. But after a while, like I was an extra on a, a big movie, right? I did that one time. And during that time, I was thinking, okay, I don't need to do this anymore. I'm not going to learn anymore from this. And I don't, I don't, I didn't enjoy it myself. Other people do. Um, so uh, again, unless they're paying, you know, so the, the, the boxes are money, material, people, mm -hmm. experience, maybe those four, something like that. Um, yeah. I want to work at that theater company. They're not paying anything. Still, I want to work at that theater company. Um, I don't like this material, but it's a really nice paycheck. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, a different kind uh, of role for you. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Right. Um, like right now I'm in two hours of makeup in the morning. I've never done a job like that. I'm a, you know, an alien. That's a, that's a hoot. Uh, when are you going to play Richard the third? I, I do audition for, great. You'd be great. I, I do audition for Shakespeare in Chicago. I've never done Shakespeare. Wow. You'd be great. Um, let me see what else I have here. Uh, do you think comedy as comedy changes, um, do you think today's comedy has influenced you or changed you? Or do you look at comedy differently, younger generations? Or what do you think about that? Um, I don't, I, I think, you know, it's interesting because, you know, every now and again, comedy goes through a popular thing. But I, I think it's, it's all, what's, you know, I still think the Marx Brothers are hilarious. I still think Young Frankenstein is fantastic. Um, uh, and I also think there's a lot on Adult Swim that just cracks me up. I, I don't know that um, I, it goes through phases like Jim Carrey was hilarious. I, and still some of that stuff is great, um, like the first couple. Um, I, I don't know. I, uh, I don't think I'm necessarily in, I, you know, I think my sensibilities 
about what's funny have not necessarily changed that much. Um, and I, I just think that like always, a lot of what's put out there, I don't find funny. Um, and a lot of what's put out there, I don't find good, but I think I, you could drop me in any year uh, since, you know, the Lumiere brothers I, and look at films from any one of those years and 90% of them are, I, I wouldn't relate to. Mm -hmm. um, good, good. I see a, a number of questions here about how one gets involved at Second City. How old can you be? Can you audition? How does that all work? Um, I. Again, I don't know what it's what it's like now, but they have a huge school. They have school for every age. Um, and most of the times, so they have a, an, an initial school and then they have a conservatory all within Second City. They also have their own film school, which is associated with DePaul in Chicago. Oh. Um, and I, I believe they still have a school in Hollywood. They have a small theater in Hollywood and they run a school out of there. Mm -hmm. And I believe that they have all ages and they often in Chicago anyway is where their theaters are their sketch reviews and the, the usually the graduates of the schools feed into the the spots that become available in the touring companies and then on the the resident stages um but I I think you can be any age to start taking classes I, they don't necessarily they don't tend to hire people for the stages until they're in their 20s but Okay, good. You know, you know, out here we have UCB and the Groundlings. Do you find that those groups, along with Second City, end up that talent ends up merging, or is it competitive? Or I think it's both. Um, I think you know maybe the schools try to differentiate themselves and the styles that they use. Um, but I, I I always find we used to there didn't used to be a lot of schools. There was, you know, there was Second City. That was pretty much it. And Groundling was, has been out here for a very long time, but mm -hmm. uh, Second City was the, the one where everybody, you know, you went to Chicago to, because that's where improvisation took place. Um, and then people started moving to New York from Second City, UCB being the first gang. They were Second City and IO people from Dell. Um, and they opened up a theater. Then people broke off from that and opened up the Pitt Theater. People broke off from that and opened up the Magnet Theater. So there was three theaters in New York from Dell's students. Um, and then out here was UCB moved out here and Sharna had her own theater called IO West. And um, so it was, it, you were able to, go, and I've worked at all of the theaters. I like, I like them all. They're all, and I know all of them. So they're, they're Great, except I don't know the people at the Groundlings, uh, I, but I've been to shows there, I love it. Um, I find that people can get something out of each of those, even though they are somewhat different philosophies, I think you can expose yourself to all of those things and see what you respond to. That's great, that's really great. Um, let's see here. Um... But again, I think the key is exposing oneself to so many things. Mm -hmm. uh, to find out what it is that I really respond to. Cause I don't, I won't know unless I really try it. Right, good. Um, how do you, being an improv guy and on the moment kind of guy and all that kind of stuff, when you get in something, have you been in a situation where there were lots of takes, multiple takes and, and well, you had to try to keep things fresh? Uh, what, what how, do, how do you do that? Well, I think it's part of uh, the training of improvisation that it's, well, and also I, uh, there's that, True and False, that Mammoth book. Yeah. I, I really like that because he suggests that the job is to learn the text so well that you're just honestly responding to the moment. You're whatever that other person is doing, you're just responding to that, although you're using these words. Mm -hmm. But I, I, how I say them, that changes all the time. And I've, I've also in the, the, companies that I've worked with and the casts that I've worked with in plays are kind of into that also. You don't find too many people that you can, you know, sometimes you see an actor and you can see them go, uh, two, three, look, two, three, say my line, two, three. And yeah. no matter what you're doing or what's going on or what baby's crying or what lamp has just fallen, they're gonna continue to do what it is they do. Um, and I think improvisers have a, a better awareness and better. And again, it's just about listening and paying attention. I just think that's so important to be. The job is to be present. 
that David, that that is such a great note for for actors. When I when I when I think of all the different actors I've worked with, you know, and and like you, you work work with a million different actors, really good actors who are very different. The one thing they do all have in common is they all made me feel like a great actor because they were so present and connected. Yeah. It's that then, actor who you can't change that makes you feel like you're just at sea by yourself. Absolutely, because you are. They're not there. They're all just in here. Yeah. Um, yeah, and that's unpleasant to be around. And, I, and then, like, if I recognize that's unpleasant to be around, I don't want to be like that guy. How do I not be like that guy? Oh, pay attention. Yeah, wow. Um, when you showed up on Angels and Demons, that, that was... Did you shoot abroad? Were you in Italy? Yeah, shot in Rome. What's and it I like really... when you show up on, on a, because because I know you've done a lot of indies and you've done a lot of stuff yourself. What What's that feeling when you show up on one of those big A-list sets? What is that like? Uh, it's uh, thrilling and a little, you know, off-putting. Uh, but again, they were really nice people that, that Ron Howard, uh, just the nicest guy um and so they really make you feel like you're supposed to be there right yeah. that's i think a thing that's a great attitude to what well, i'm supposed to be here but i it's easy to forget that i'm supposed to be here they want they've asked me to be here i didn't just show up mm -hmm. and you know you know grab somebody's wardrobe and and sneak out on set they've asked me to be here they you know i'm supposed to be here but it's easy to forget that that i belong here yeah that's that's a great way of looking at it um i think we're kind of at the point where i should probably ask you what advice would you give young actors who are i mean these guys a lot of these guys they're they're in this great environment where unlike you or me they're surrounded by all these people who are probably going to be relatively successful and thinking about this next big step, what are your thoughts on that these days? I, I, I it's a similar thing. If I try to regularly check in to find out what it is that I want, um, and and again without judgment, um, I want to make some money. If that's what I want to do, I would not advise becoming an improviser. <laughs> um, uh, but if like if whatever it is that I want to do and also try everything, try everything and try it more than once um, and take jobs that are uh, again in that that Nicholson interview was fantastic. The guy it was a long time ago, so he wasn't a superstar mm -hmm. and uh, he was asking him, are you embarrassed by those old Roger Corman movies? And he goes, I'm embarrassed about everything. <laughs> Right. So I, think I remember that interview. Wasn't that the interview where he said it takes 20 years to make to for an actor to be successful? I don't I didn't see that part of it. Wow. I remember. Yeah, I mean, it's it's it, it's and so hopefully I'm going to be and, you know, I'm going to look back on stuff. It's like, oh, I should have done that. And that's the way it is. I look at something like, oh, wow, that's not what I thought that would look like. I, and then, but there it is on screen. So I was wrong. Um, and so I learned from that. Um, and I yeah. think just, uh, just doing it, doing stuff with your friends, doing, doing anything, um, being part of a, uh, production because, and that's another thing that happens in Chicago. Um, oh, we need somebody to be part of crew. Okay. I'll do that. Um, I'm an actor. I don't know what I'm doing. We'd love to have your hands. That'd be great. Um, uh, you know, just do everything. Yeah. Try everything. And you just meet the greatest people. I remember when I first came to LA, I was gripping on a movie. Me, Richard Gere, and Kevin Costner were grips. Now, fantastic. two out of those three people became really famous movie stars. That's fantastic. <laughs> but still, that's that's this life, isn't it? It's so wonderful. Right, and it and I I still get thrilled every time I walk onto a lot. Me every too. time I walk onto a set, um, I get I just get a huge kick out of it, and it doesn't matter the the budget. I Get, get a kick out of it every single time. Me too. And every time I run into an actor like you where we can talk about this stuff, I just think, wow, this is the greatest life. I wouldn't have traded it for anything. That's the truth. I would not have traded this for anything. And also it's brought me things that are kind of impossible. 
like we started out improvising in this little room upstairs coming up with the, the this long form improvisation and imp just improvisation has brought me around the world, um, which was imp that's impossible. That's impossible to go improvise all over Europe. That's impossible. That's that's just wonderful. And and because of the longevity of your career, I, I would I think the voiceover and the um, uh, you know, that kind of career, the commercials, it's changed a lot, isn't it? Now it's now much more non-union, much more wide open to new people. What's your thought on that? Well, yeah, I used to do a, a, a fair amount of voiceover. I haven't booked a job, a commercial job in I don't know how many years. It just stopped. I don't know what, no one can explain to me what happened. Doesn't um, it seem to be pretty much either celebrity driven or non-union celebrity and non-union take up a huge chunk yeah that used to be and also there was a thing that in chicago it used to be uh, because of technology it used to be limited geographically and chicago was a huge post-production advertising town and they had to use people standing in chicago to do the voiceover for the commercials mm -hmm. they don't have to do that anymore wow Wow, let me see if there's anything else I wanna ask you before I forget here. Any other questions you wanna throw into the chat, you guys? Um, tell us a little bit about Lodge 49. Oh, that was that was the job that I walked on that I didn't know anyone. Wow, um, that's a cool show. Oh man, that was so much fun. What a great group of people. Um, oh, that was another thing. That show, you know, like um, the people that I like um, and admire really take it seriously. We all have a great time uh, screwing around and, and goofing off and just, uh, that's a great part of it. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. But they take their jobs really seriously. Um, we show up for work and everybody's ready and you get a curveball thrown at you like, oh, we're not doing that scene today. We're doing this scene today. There's a two page speech that I was not yet that I didn't think we were gonna do. I better be ready. Mm -hmm. um, and. And they, you know, people take their time going off on, a, on their, and I can't go out, I can't go to coffee today because I'm going to work, you know, working on my own to be prepared for the things that I have coming up. So the work ethic is, I think, a really important thing, as well as the fun. But that, that group, that writing, Jim Gavin wrote it all, Peter Ako uh, was the showrunner, uh, Nina Jack, it, and Deb Zane, who I'd never met before. Uh, the mm -hmm. casting director. Mm -hmm. um, I, that was the first time I'd ever met her. And that's why I got that job. Wow. And she's done a million things. She's great. She's really wonderful. What else do you want to do? Do you have stuff you still think about? Uh, Shakespeare, maybe you mentioned. Yeah. You know, I'm, I, I, so I've written a bunch of stuff, but always with people. Um, and so I've been late I, for the last while. I've been trying to write a play on my own. Mm -hmm. um, and that's proving to be a real difficult thing. Yeah. So I'd like to get that done and produced. So you still want to get back in front of live audiences. Oh, know? I love it. I absolutely love that. Yeah. What's uh what's the trade-off for you? What do you like about being on camera? What do you like about being on stage? Well, generally you get paid more on camera. Yes, and there are residuals. Yep. There you have it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's it. I always felt too like I don't know if it's just because of that, the money. But I love the people that I got to work with on camera. You just, you find yourself all of a sudden one day, there you are with somebody you've watched for years. And right. Yes. And I do, I, I am truly tickled by filmmaking. I just am really impressed by people who do it well. Um, and, and all the aspects of it, the technical aspects, you know, like uh, something like Angels and Demons there. Now what's going on here? Oh yeah, you're, this is a, the parking lot of a casino, but it's gonna be a huge cathedral. Uh, wow, yeah, that mind. I, um, I, I was, I'll just throw that out. I was in the movie Titanic and I remember, and at that time I was also, uh, I was also making an independent film and Jim Cameron, the director, understood that I was, I wanted to make films too. And so one day he was setting up the shot and I was watching him and he said, do you know what I'm doing? Cause he was doing something with depth perception and all this stuff. And I said, it looks like you're doing something with depth perception. And he said, yeah, the technology doesn't yet exist to release this movie in 3D, but it will in 10 years. So I'm also making a 3D movie. So when the technology catches up with me, I'll be able to do that. And I was, 
He's oh making God. a movie for 10 years from now. Yeah. Wow. Can you believe that? And, and, wow. and you know, there are people like that in our business, aren't they? It yep. just blows your mind. And yet you hear stuff about, oh, he's not a good people person. Well, okay, but <laughs> there's that. <laughs> I don't know. Who have you ever, who have you ever run into? This is just kind of a personal silly thing about show business. Who did you ever run into that you kind of went, oh my God, it's me I, and them. Uh, I was doing a voiceover session in Los Angeles at uh, Fuzzies. And uh, I, I come walking out of the studio and went down to get a cup of coffee and James Coburn walks out of the studio. Wow. And I don't often get too starstruck, but James Coburn did it for me. Oh. Those oh. I don't know if you, he was in like Flint, he was in the Magnificent Seven for the rest of the, those are names that mean absolutely nothing to your students. <laughs> but they do know Julia Louise Dreyfus. What's oh she yes, like? Fan fantastic. She seems like she's just fantastic. Fun to play with, huh? So great, that whole gang, that whole gang. And each, the majority of the people in that show, the cast have something to do with Chicago. She went to Northwestern and had a theater company in Chicago. Uh, Kevin Dunn's from Chicago. Gary Cole's from Chicago. Uh, Tim Simons came through Chicago. Matt Walsh is from Chicago. Um, it's, uh, so Chicago's a viable place for a young actor. Yeah, absolutely, especially with a little bit of a uh, comedy interest. When you talk about comedy, one last question, because I think we're out of time, but uh, somebody just asked me, what What's it like working on a set with a bunch of other comedians? It depends if there, it depends on the kind of comedian. Sometimes it's really, really boring uh, because they're, uh, they're all figuring out how to be funnier than the next person. And it's dreadfully, uh, it's dreadful. But a lot of times, and that's one of the things about improvisation too. I think those people generally are more, community oriented and they're a hoot to hang around with. I, most of my buddies are just a blast to hang around with. And that's what I miss about this, you know, that we have to not be around people. That's the thing I miss most. Yeah, well, I'm telling you, it was a blast to have you here with us today. And I'm sure everyone agrees with me and thinking you'd be fun to hang around with and work with. So I, I hope- My you all best to all, all your students, uh, uh, wish you all the best. <laughs>